Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring Sys Admin Expert, Don Pizzette. Security Specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to, what's the name again? Because we've, we've been off for like three weeks. Technado That's with it. Don Pizzette. That's where we are. And I am joined by Don Pizzette, who has perfect attendance so far this year. That's right. It's my, uh, my New Year's resolution. Really? Let's see how long that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Normally they're gone by now. Yeah. Next week, yeah. Don won't be here. First week, well, yeah. you know, I, actually, I, I was supposed to miss an upcoming week because of RSA, mm-hmm. but RSA has been pushed all the way back to June. So we'll, we'll see. I'll get to miss a day then. But, yeah, well, uh, I'm sure it'll get pushed again. And again, Who knows? I was really hoping yeah. to care. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they'll have COVID cured by then, though, right? I mean, oh, right. <laughs> you can cure anything in six months. Yeah, easily. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that's accurate. We did our prediction episode last week, so that's when you should yeah. have brought that up. Yeah. Uh, and Daniel, how are you today? I am uh, not unwell, thank you, sir. Oh, sporting the, uh, the B-Sides Tampa The B-Sides. Shirt. You know, this funny, funny story talking about COVID. I got this T-shirt at B-Sides in 2019, right? Or the beginning of 2020. 2020 uh, it was uh, the right? beginning yeah. of 2020. And as soon as I got home, they they announced on the news that the first COVID patient in the United States or in uh, the East Coast was in Tampa. And I was like, I just came from an international like, conference. Was it, was it me? <laughs> well, uh, his, him, uh, <laughs> patient zero. It's, 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 a, it's a photo of you on the news. Hypochondria starts kicking in real hard at that point. And that other voice you hear today is our special guest today. We have Paul Dior, who's the co-founder of ReadyWorks. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. No problem. And you're, uh, it, it's cold where you are, right? We were talking about that earlier. Yeah, I'm in the Northeast, and it just flipped the switch. It got real cold real fast. Yeah, there's like, there's probably people that are still stuck on I-95 listening to this podcast <laughs> by the time it, it comes out. So thank you for, for joining us yeah. if that's where you are. Be safe. All right, well, let's jump in and get to know Paul a little bit more, uh, more in our first segment, which is Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Paul. In this segment, we are going to rapidly fire questions at you. We'll rotate amongst us hosts, and uh, each of us will ask you a question. A timer will appear on the right side of your screen. You'll have approximately one minute to answer each question. Oh, I was early. I took too long with my instructions. If you take too long, you get buzzed, kind of like that. Yeah, I won't do yeah, it again. There we go. I won't uh, do it again. Sure. <laughs> we'll move on to the next question. The first question will come at you from Peter. I'm obviously rusty. It's the, it's the new year. <laughs> it's the new one. year. Working out, working yeah. out the kinks. <laughs> <You're good. happy. laughs> All right. Well, Paul, so to get started, uh, can you just give us an overview of ReadyWorks and tell us what you guys do there? Yeah, sure thing. So, so uh, ReadyWorks is a SaaS platform, and what we do is we use AI and automation uh, to reduce the cost and risk of uh, IT transformations for big enterprises. Um, so what that means is every organization is trying to do some digital transformation and they're really using antiquated tools and different approaches that really haven't evolved in about 20 years. And so we've taken a different approach to, to how that happens. And, and again, reducing the cost and risk of, of that, uh, of those efforts. So you, you mentioned like cost and risk is, is the goal here to, to like get the transformation done faster, or is it just to reduce the amount of resources you need, like get less people involved? What, what's the, the primary focus? Yeah, across the board, right? The approach is really just uh, um, hasn't changed in 20 years. It's it's spreadsheets of information from different siloed systems. It's armies of engineers and consultants trying to mash together some information and then put together plans of action, uh, of outreach to, to the business owners, to the stakeholders and so forth. And it's just done in a very, very manual sort of way. So so our approach and our thesis is really just applying tech and intelligence instead of bodies and, and brute force, and then applying automation for things that can be repeated over and over again. And that ultimately has the benefit for you know, faster timelines, um, less overhead and, and, and cost, and then just doing things with more consistency because the more hands you have in the, in the, in the soup, right, there's more uh, chances for error, there's more bad data, and, and by, by automating that and using kind of the, the underlying systems, uh, we're able to just drive the efficiencies you know, pretty significantly, probably about, about 40, um, a 40% uh, offset for, for labor, and then the risk is, is kind of a, a, a moving target, but, but it's definitely a part of the puzzle. I don't know how you're cooking soup, but I don't, I, you don't want your hands in the soup. <laughs> That's a weird soup. I think we're mixing our, uh, our sayings. There. Yeah. Plus, I think they put people in like mental institutions. I'm making soup. <laughs> no, no, you're not. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's get back to uh, ReadyWorks. Uh, Paul, is any type of system uh, uh, up for grabs on this, or do you have to have some sort of like API or something to connect to it? 
Yeah, no, that, that's kind of part of our secret uh, uh, kind of sauce, right? So we're able to connect into any place where there's information, right? Every organization has made investments in different systems, different tools, different things that have a function. So we're connecting to them by direct connections into the databases or via APIs, or if there's a CSV export that we're ingesting on some sort of scheduled basis, the goal is, is to kind of bring all this information that's otherwise siloed and then having a working uh, um, um, kind of place for, for all of it. So is this something that's targeted more the small business that is trying to, uh, you know, get do more with less or, or the enterprise level that, that has all these these uh, big systems or, or kind of both? Can you work with both there? Yeah, yeah. So so our smallest customer is probably about 2,000 assets or seats, if you will. And then our largest is, you know, over hundreds of thousands with millions of changes on a daily basis. So, so you know, we tend to skew more towards the enterprise customer. That said, it's really for anyone that's got legacy infrastructure or legacy footprint, and that's really trying to go through these transformations. It's trying to take them from some starting point and then evolve into, to, you know, a, a new target end state. Gotcha. So in a second, we're going to talk about kind of how you got started in this. But uh, this is a relatively new venture, only only a couple of years old. So where are you guys at right now? What's 2022 hold for you? Are you kind of in growth mode at this point? You know, the thing is, it's it's uh, um, it's a new venture in the sense that the, the, the software platform and, and the focus of, of what we do as a, as a platform is, is uh, uh, kind of new. But, but the challenge and the pain is kind of the same, and it's going to be an ongoing and a growing one, you know, going forward. Uh, the idea of transformations are it's it's you're never going to be done. You're never going to get to the point where you're going to uh, uh, get to some end point and then you're going to stop. It's going to be an ongoing pace and, and, and the scope and the scale and the complexity of all of that is just going to continue to grow, right? We're kind of seeing a perfect storm of um, um, the demand, the complexity, the different environments, more of everything. And so, so our goal is really just to kind of keep focus on what we do really well and, and continue to kind of build off of that foundation and, and build into more and more use cases in a, in a horizontal sort of way. Makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, that, that's kind of a great segue to talk about our next segment, which we want to talk about kind of where you got started, where uh, not just you personally got started, but the idea for Ready, Ready Works and what this came out of, because it sounds like, you know, maybe a problem that you faced personally and and, uh, and found that solution for. So let's move on to our next segment, which is the origin story. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, oh, I got a big myself- intro I'm playing. Sorry. <laughs> Sound effects. <laughs> This is a pretty hardcore origin story. I mean, that's that's my one thing that I get to do in this. <laughs> please please don't, don't take rob me away. him of his joy. Yeah, I know I screwed up the buzzer earlier, and I apologize for that. But yeah, so let, let's talk about that that origin story. So, uh, you know, where where were you when you had this idea and said this is something that we need to do and we can do better? Sure, sure. So um, just prior to ReadyWorks, myself and the other co-founders were essentially, uh, um, we bootstrapped a services organization that we ran for nearly 20 years. And what we were doing was was helping large enterprise organizations, you know, uh, um, really deploy big transformations. So so we partnered with the Microsofts, the Semantics, the Cisco's of the world, and we became VARs and integrators that helped them deploy their technology into these customer bases. So so we were constantly um, um, dealing with organizations that were trying to deploy new stuff, deal with the changes, the complexities, and the, and the bottlenecks of, of deploying these things. And they're inherently long, they're inherently costly, and there's, there's a lot of risk associated with introducing change to companies you know, at scale. And so you know, for, for nearly 20 years, that's where we cut our teeth. And, and we were constantly faced with the questions of, how do we do this better? How do we do this more efficiently? How do we make ourselves and our offerings more competitive? And, and that was really the genesis of this idea. Um, so it started out as a couple of scripts, a couple of you know, cobbled together pieces of, of, of ways to do things better, uh, eventually morphed into this notion of a platform and what ReadyWorks is today which is you know a standalone software company but but it's really built out of being in the trenches for 20 years doing deployments of you know hundreds of thousands of, de- uh, of endpoints and devices and rollouts uh, transforming data centers you know from from you know five six footprints into one in a hybrid cloud sort of environment so on and so forth so 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 we cut our teeth on doing it in the trenches and built a platform that really supported our emotions and and that's really you know again what we've now taken to market as a standalone offering that uh, um, really, customers are kind of getting the same benefits that we did as a as a provider, you know, in early days. So I'm always curious it, it, when when somebody starts a new company, it's usually you see a problem and you fix it, right? So you've got a, a solution to an issue, which you guys definitely did. But it, it kind of seems like there's a an end to the problem, right? That you've got a lot of companies that haven't made the transition into the cloud, or they have these disparate proprietary systems that they're trying to migrate away from. D- do you ever see that? ending like there comes a point where like hey look we've we've transformed everybody 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was saying earlier. Like it's 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 like my analogy is like you know getting fit or or becoming healthy, right? You don't change your diet and start working out and then just stop, right? The whole point is it's it's a it's a different approach to doing things, and the 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 scale and the pace of changes is, is not going to. Um, um, end, you know, whether it's a new desktop for Windows 10 or 11 or whatever the next version is going to be, or when you migrate your workloads to the cloud, what security vulnerabilities is going to open up, or if you deploy kit and, and IoT devices to the edge, what happens when you need to do an upgrade or, or swap out that infrastructure. So you're actually just seeing more of everything, but you're seeing uh, a best in class solutions at very, very specific point solutions. And then that just creates this, this really, really complex um, heterogeneous ecosystem of stuff and that's all changing constantly. So, so I think, you know, to your point, um, you know, some of the traditional tools and some of the old approaches were really to manage a steady state with known processes and known stuff, uh, where, where this notion of evolution and, and constantly transforming, that's kind of the norm, right? You, you're never going to be done. I think it's just going to continue to accelerate with more pieces in the puzzle. Now, technology is moving really fast right now. Some of that driven by COVID, some of that just driven by the way the market is. We're seeing a lot of really cool innovations. So for an organization like you guys, you have to stay on top of all that. So how do you do that? How do you stay aware of what's the next greatest thing or, or whether something's actually going to stick around or a technology that's just a fad? You know, it, it's, you know, the old adage is you get the best feedback from your customers and you see when we're, we're engaging with folks, you know, we'll start on a particular initiative or initial uh, a program of, of moving things to the cloud or, or migrating or deploying a new uh, um, ERP or whatever. Uh, but then the, 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 it becomes very horizontal. You know, you've got the data, you have the information, you have the insight. Now you're able to manage change and deploy that, you know, successfully and, and carefully and mitigate your risk. And if you're doing that here, you can do that, you know, rinse and repeat time and time and time again. And you now have that, that information and that, that book of knowledge is almost like um, um, kind of institutional information. Because historically what would happen is, is this project would happen, you'd bring an army of people in to do the work, and then they'd go away. And then all of that knowledge and all of that IP would, would move away with the team that deployed it. Now you have that information and that becomes kind of the foundation for how you manage and, and embrace, you know, those transformations, you know, on an ongoing basis. It, it kind of sets you up with a, with a solid foundation. Uh, um, so, you know, we're constantly hearing feedback from customers as far as what's relevant, what they need, and we're, we're integrating that into our, our, into our footprint. But it's the idea that it's always evolving and there's always going to be something new. And it's the, really your ability to consume that on a, on, a, on a consistent basis that doesn't break anything in the process. Now, I, I, I want to ask a fun question here because <laughs> organizations like yours, you, you get to experience a number of different companies and, and no two companies are the same. They all have different right. technologies deployed different ways. What's the biggest nightmare technology for you? The, the one that you see and you're like, oh, not another yeah. one of these. You're looking for a, a beam that'll hold your weight and a length of rope. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think there's always this this uh, expectation or, or perspective that people know what's out there and people know who's using it or, or how it's being used. And, and again, the larger the organization, the more uh, uh, um, hands there are in an infrastructure that's evolved over years that becomes more and more nebulous and more and more unclear. So, so oftentimes people think that, you know, there's this pristine information that sits in a CMDB somewhere and everybody knows, but that is very rarely the case. And it's often a, a discovery session and a, and a, and a you know, fact finding mission. And you're aggregating and pulling together kernels of information along the way. So, so there's no one single culprit. It's, it's really, I think, managing the expectation of what you know, the business wants what they want yesterday, and they just expect IT to do it you know, tomorrow. And, and you know, there's massive gaps between what the expectations are and, and what uh, people are equipped to be able to do. And so, so kind of bridging that gap is, is the, is the, is the biggest rub that we often encounter. That was a great politician's answer. There. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you're going to call somebody out specifically. He's Paul DeWar and he approved this message. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I, I want to talk kind of about uh, what's, what's the future for, for ReadyWorks. And it sounds like, uh, we've got some, some big announcements coming down the road from you guys in terms of, of the next steps. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm thrilled to uh, to announce that probably by the time this thing goes live, we're going to formally announce our, our Series A round, which was uh, uh, we did that in partner with uh, the Credit Suisse Next Fund, which we're which we're thrilled about. And so so it's really kind of taken our vision for the space that we've been working on for for a number of years, and and um, you know enabling us to kind of take it to the next level. So so we're you know we're growing on on every front. We're going to be you know pursuing you know additional hires and growing our our respective teams from you know product and development to customer success. To 
to, to sales and marketing and, and really pushing on all of those uh, objectives. But, um, um, you know, it just kind of takes the, this, this foundation that we've, you know, bootstrapped to, to date and then taking it, you know, uh, uh, to the next level with, with uh, you know, additional capacity and, and you know, kind of more, more support and resources and, and all those good things. So, so uh, yeah, super, super excited. And, 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 you know, 2022 is off to a great start. That's awesome. I know as a as the co-founder there, I'm sure that was a lot of work on your end and, and the culmination of, of a lot of effort. So congratulations on that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. And if, and if people want to find out more about ReadyWorks, uh, it looks like ReadyWorks.com is the place to go. And you've got all the resources there and a lot of success stories and, and uh, opportunity for a demo and things. So uh, definitely head over to ReadyWorks.com if you want to know more. All right. Well, uh, we really, really want to thank you for taking the time with us, Paul. I know, uh, you know, the first of the year here is pretty busy. And so, uh, and especially with sounds like what, what's going on there. So we appreciate you uh, carving out some time for us. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all and share the story. And, and uh, you know, likewise, good luck to all in 2022 and, and certainly optimistic and, and uh, looking forward to what's ahead. Always optimistic at the start. We'll, we'll talk again in December. <laughs> we'll see how it went. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break and come back and talk about the news uh, from the last couple of weeks. But, uh, Paul, thank you so much, and thank you for sticking with us right through this break. We'll see you in just a second. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. I work with two technicians, Buddha and Anthony. We cover all grades at the school. We figure that we support approximately 800 end user devices. My name is Buddha Nepal. I work as an IT support here and AV specialist. I moved into IT department and and on our first meeting, other team members asked me, "Hey." What's your IT background? And I was like, I don't have any. We had this SharePoint project that we were rolling out. So I was able to go to IT Pro TV and um, watch. And by the end of this month, we were actually migrating all our files to SharePoint. I can use IT Pro TV's uh, supervisor portal to check the progress of my technicians so I can see what they're looking at. So when we were doing SharePoint training, I can go in and I can see that Buddha is hitting on that content. I really want to see hands-on how they do things. And if there was an IT Pro TV, I don't know how I would have done that. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide, this is important for me to learn and go out and learn. At home, I have Apple TV and there is an app there. And so I actually watch on Apple TV. I, I watch it in my iPad too. Saturday mornings, I still get up early. 6.30, I go grab a cup of coffee, I sit down on the couch, and I typically watch two or three episodes uh, as I just kind of increase my own learning skill set. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team that is looking to extend their knowledge. Uh, it offers a great, easy to access, interactive, entertaining uh, environment. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pizzette. Thank you so much to Paul for joining us there. But uh, we've got a lot of news to get to because the last couple of weeks, you know. We've been phoning it in. I don't know if you know, <laughs> but those were pre-recorded. Uh, so. Shut Sorry to, up. Sorry to ruin, you know, br break the fourth wall. And, uh, the Hollywood magic. And Can't that, trust him but, with any uh, secrets over here. But yeah, so we're, uh, we're we're looking back. The news goes back a couple of weeks, uh, and we picked the best stories from the past. Uh, two, you know, like two to three weeks. I I'd really say. enjoyed it because we had so many different things to pick from. Because you know, some weeks it's like all security news or whatever. Here I had about three weeks. You mean weeks that like every week? Every week, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always security yeah. news. Yeah, I mean, did did you all get rid of your blackberries? No, Adam probably is like lighting candles right now. Yeah, I, hoping it'll work. I thought about asking Adam to be on the show today, but then I, I didn't pick the BlackBerry article. Just as a memorial service yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, that's how good the articles were, that we don't even have the BlackBerry article. Okay. Uh, all right, our first uh, comes to us from TheVerge.com. Dell's Luna laptop concept is all about repairability. And I think, you know, I called this in my prediction. I said, right to repair. Uh, it's the big buzzword for 2022. Already correct. Uh, so this this is not like the modular laptop that that you have done. This is more, it's simple to repair. It's easy screws, you know, things like that. I can get into right. It. So it, a lot of people are calling out as basically being a framework clone. The framework laptop is the the modular laptop that's completely easily repairable. Uh, well, this one is similar, right? So this is Dell's kind of response to that, and it's just a concept. They're not 
promising to make this laptop. Dell's announced a couple of new hardware projects that are kind of their prototypes, what we might see in the near future. So this laptop is very easily repairable. All the parts can come out. It has fewer screws than any other Dell laptop manufactured. Uh, so that makes it easy to get into it to change out parts. It has less than 102 screws. Yeah, it has 101. <laughs> yeah. And uh, But it doesn't have the modular, like you can't change out the ports ah. on the side of it like the framework. Uh, but they did some really interesting things, like it's a fanless laptop because they moved the motherboard into the lid instead of having it in the base of the laptop like a normal system uh, to hopefully keep it cooler and away from the rest of the components. So really interesting changes. We'll see if they actually release this, but right now it's under that Luna name. I doubt that name would stay, but that's what they've got it tagged as now. Problem is it keeps tipping over because the... The motherboard's in the screen now. So they showed a spec of it, uh, some of the engineering diagrams, and the motherboard is tiny. Hmm, really? uh, so it's almost like system on a chip size. So that's going to keep the weight down. And if your hard drive and battery and all that is in the base, I don't think it will tip over. I think it'll be fine. And it said that it, it doesn't have any of the glues and things. So, you know, sometimes you yep. need heat guns or, or solvents pain. to yeah, actually get pain. something open. So. That'd I mean, cool. it's one thing to undo those things, and then it's a whole other to put it back in, right? Like, yeah. Especially when it comes to screen bezels and... Oh, well, the pain. cool thing is the water can now get in more easily as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, the way a lot of holes for that. <laughs> I still think Framework has a leg up on them because of the interchangeable modules uh, and the, the supposed upgradability that you'll have in the future. So Dell's not trying for either of those. They're yeah. just saying repairability. I yeah. think it's funny that they're kind of getting flack for this. It's like... So you don't want us doing good ideas? Yeah, is this what gonna, you asked for? Complain about this? I, I think the the problem here is that they just didn't do it sooner, oh. right? So this is a total knee jerk reaction. Is yeah. very obvious. Okay, well, they did it before Apple. So they did. Uh, I doubt they Apple. Did. Apple is never. Yeah, yeah everyone did it before right. Apple. Yeah, because it's not happening. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got more news from Dell as well in this next article from ArsTechnica.com. Dell's magnetic wireless webcam concept may help you forget about that infamous nose cam. So we're uh, we got a lot of concepts. Uh, that, that team is working <laughs> Man, overtime. R and D at Dell. at Dell is just cooking. Huh? If you made this stuff, it would be cool. They're but cooking math. <laughs> so let's go back first. They mentioned the infamous nose cam. Yeah. Uh, that was where they. Is that where they put the the. Uh, Camera, camera on the bottom of the screen? Right, as, as close to the hinge as possible. Why? Why would they? Why? So they envisioned everyone taking their new laptops that had the full, what do they call it, like a 360 oh, full the, display? Right. The tent. Yeah. But they would fold it into a tent, set it there, and then do their conferencing that way. So the camera would be at the top. But the reality is nobody pays attention in conferences. And it's hard to browse Google News or eBay or whatever when you're in a meeting if the camera is at the top and you're I in a tent mode. I just watch the whole time. There you go. See. So uh, so people don't like it and you end up with a camera that's at the bottom of the screen looking straight up your nose. But it's the better part to terrible. me was the, was the hands. Oh yeah. When someone will be on their keyboard it's just like that's all you get on the screen. <laughs> it was a terrible idea. But this new one this is this looks cool. This is really neat. Yeah. So it is a it's a wireless webcam and it's magnetic so it can attach to any magnetic or metallic surface. I don't yeah. Well, not every ferrous, metal is magnetic. Ferrous metals? Whatever. Yes. And magnets, know. magic. So uh, so it can attach. And they have a, a kind of a demo monitor they've got set up where the entire screen is magnetic. So you can actually put the webcam right on the screen. So when you're in a meeting, you're now looking in somebody's eyes instead of looking off at a camera somewhere else. Kind of a neat concept. Or if you're reading from a document in a presentation, yeah. you have it in the document as opposed to up in the top. Or so down I can be running a web embedded version of Quake to and stick the camera right over on my health bar and that way I'm able to you know <laughs> yeah. look like I'm focused on the and meeting. And you could move it during the meeting if you needed to. Or so when like I that. read the article it was talking about how people want to look good because we use all these meetings we want it to look nice and our faces are in the right position because you look at your laptop you know if it's down a little bit and you kind of get the up mm -hmm. nose shot and you get these weird forced perspective you know shots and it, mm -hmm. it does look a little weird. But other than that why why not just put the thing in the most optimal position and then call it a day? Like, why do I need to be able to magnetize it to well, maybe an over-the-shoulder shot? Or, you know, what, what are we getting artsy? I think I can answer that here, Zoom though. Meeting? So the, the, the most optimal spot is wherever you're looking. And so right. you're going to be looking at your screen. So in the middle of your screen is the okay. optimal spot. So you don't want a permanent camera right in the middle of your screen. Now I got one I'll yeah. lose. We've already this got one. the Apple yeah, bezel issue. Yeah. The, there are, I think it was Apple was working on one that would go under your screen. Well, because they've been wanting that for the, for the mobile device to be able right. to do the, the face scans and stuff without having right, right, the right. notch. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll see if we get there. 
this, I, I don't think this will ever come to market. I think yeah. that it's easy to lose, like you mentioned, right. but also the magnetic clip holder isn't yeah. really suitable for a laptop. This is definitely designed for a desktop. Or, or the first yeah, sure. time you close your laptop without taking the magnet off and just well, crack your whole oh, screen. Oh, yeah, I didn't they, think of that. That's true. And they also said it only lasts about an hour, and a lot of meetings go well beyond an oh, hour. Oh, yeah, the battery so life. You, you would have to have it in the docking station or move it to the docking station yep. so that it would do charging. Maybe yeah. we could have a prototype where meetings don't last an hour. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be cool. Maybe that, maybe that's a like yeah, added that's benefit the purpose of this. Of it. Well, yeah. my camera's about We'd to love die. To keep going, yeah, but you know that's a Dell camera. So <laughs> help me out here because I know in the old days, if you had a magnet near your TV or something, you're screwing up that TV. That's CRT, right? Does right. That, that does has no issue with with. Nope. What are we on? LED yeah, LCDs now? and LEDs are are not affected by okay. that. Get buck wild. <laughs> All the magnets you want. Yeah. Man, my, He's my over whole, there with a the car battery. Yeah. <laughs> my box of magnets I can bring back yeah. out now. The That's fillings awesome. in your teeth are like pulling your <laughs> yeah. head towards the screen. Like, yeah. I don't think those are magnetic. <laughs> MRIs are jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look at our next one. comes to us from bleepingcomputer.com. We're sticking in the hardware space here. Uh, well, kind of. I like uh, hardware. Yeah. yeah. Lenovo laptops vulnerable to bug, allowing admin privileges. So, Ruh -roh. so how is one brand of laptop? Is that? I mean, that means it's some kind of software on that right. laptop. Yeah, in this case, and we've seen this before with some other vendors, but in this case, it's some of the pre-installed software, the the Lenovo management software that allows it to pull like your system's uh, serial number or processor ID. Their software is able to interface with the system to pull that information from the hardware. And that software obviously is, is pretty sensitive because it's running, it has to run at the system level to be able to interact directly with the hardware. And a couple of security researchers have found a way to take advantage of it. So this was a pretty interesting hack that they've got. The software actually used a, a pretty old technology called named pipes. Named mm -hmm. pipes are like a way to communicate, usually with a database, without using a network stack. So you're not communicating over a network, you're communicating through a file. Anything you write to a file, the database can read. Anything a database writes to the file, you can read. Easy communication back and forth. Well, what the researchers found was that they could access that, that named pipe as soon as it was created. They could actually access it faster than the software itself. This is like a race condition? Yes. Ah. And so they could get there first 100% of the time. And when they got there first... They could then send whatever commands they wanted into this database to be able to communicate, and it would run and execute at the system level. Pays to be a winner. <laughs> Complete admin access on a system. So uh, there were multiple CVEs published on this. Lenovo's already rolled out a fix. But because this is pre-installed software, most people don't think about it, mm -hmm. and most people don't apply these types of fixes. So it's kind of a high risk. Well, I, do, I actually have a Lenovo laptop at home. It's my personal laptop. I also use a Lenovo laptop for work. Running Linux... Oh, yeah, so it wouldn't go. affect you. Or, <laughs> or if you did a clean install of Windows and just didn't install the Lenovo yeah, software. There you go. You you could but, it, but it, it said uh, if you did that, some of the Lenovo features would right. not work. So, like, what are you missing out on then that's specific to these laptops? Uh, so there's there's a couple of things like their battery conditioning utility or the utility that suggests additional accessories you could buy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My favorite right there. There's their driver update wizard, yeah. you know, those things, which I, I pretty much hate all the things I just mentioned. It's uh, supposed those, to be like a, a, like a digital systems admin for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So none of the bloatware will work anymore. Yeah, that's man. correct. Oh, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. So. Well, that sounds like uh, the, it sounds like a feature. Yeah, the best <laughs> bug of the year. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to release some updated versions of the bloatware so yeah, you can have God. it back. Like, thank oh, God. About to have a palpitation there, son. Yeah. <laughs> My Yahoo toolbar doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> None of this stuff. And ICQ. <laughs> right. Did we did we cover the other day the the, the uh, Google toolbar finally ended support? No. Did we? Oh, I, I might have passed Did on that we? article. I like know. I was shocked I to find out it was still supported yeah. at all, but yeah. Google what's, officially what's Google ended tool? support for their toolbar. <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. Rest in peace. One for the home. I mean, isn't the Google toolbar basically the address bar in Chrome? Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So Except good. it had ads built into it. Yeah. So it was much more spyware-y. Yeah. <laughs> Way more profitable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, our next article is... Something that somebody did that was dumb. Uh, <laughs> so this is our dough segment. All right, this comes to us from Slashdot.org. A university loses 77 terabytes of research data due to a backup error. And that that's um, a lot of data. Uh, yeah. But the cool thing about this to me is... It's like my Plex server. Your scientific research... <laughs> Like what? What good is science if it's not repeatable? <laughs> and now true. they get to do all this point, again. Yeah. 
<laughs> so the, uh, the, the negative to it is that this was on a supercomputer where it, each hour is precious on this machine. And yeah. so it's all the hours that it took to generate that data that are lost. Uh, you're totally right though. They can, they can recreate this data, uh, yeah, it, it's not not that big of a deal at the end of the day. However, I do think they're misrepresenting it a bit when they say that due to a a uh, what do they say a backup, backup error a backup error. So there wasn't an error in the backup. The backup operated exactly the way that it was intended to work. It's just it was configured to work wrong. Like whoever <laughs> set it up wasn't thinking things through. So that's why I wanted to highlight this article because what they did is they had basically a sync job set up between the production environment and the backup system. And their backup system was live and online. And they just maintained one copy of the data. Hmm. Well, when you set up that way, if you delete something in production, what happens on your backup? It deletes. Yeah. It gets deleted it's there also. Yeah. So someone, either intentionally or unintentionally, they haven't said. Someone de- named Don. Deleted data. <laughs> uh, well, the system. Did you used to work for a university, Don? So the system's in Japan, uh-huh. and like the actual article was entirely in Japanese. I couldn't even read it, so I know I didn't do it. <laughs> but maybe I could Google Not translate my way. Not this time. Not this time. Right? This is Kyoto University in Japan. Ah. So, um, uh, so. Somebody deleted the data in production, and of course, it got deleted in the backup. And since the backup was overwriting itself, it was just a sync job, yeah. right? Then it's like, I'm just was doing going. what you told me to do. Yeah, you so, told me to overwrite this. So now they've said to fix the problem, they've turned off the backup. Oh, okay, it hold on. actually fix it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they're now going to roll out incremental backups and offline backups and all the things that they should have had. Now in they're doing it? It's like, that's, this is 2022, right? That's often how backup systems get upgraded is the first one fails. Like, you know, you should be testing your restores, evaluating your conv- configuration. This one was just not set up right. I mean, that's when we got a new QNAP when the other one started smoking. Yeah, doing yeah. all that stuff takes a lot of time and effort, and I've got a lot of Sailor Moon to get through. So <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, priorities are what priorities are. Big I got function. a lot of Sailor Jerry uh, <laughs> run to get through, but um, so is it different backing up a supercomputer? Like, do you need a second supercomputer or something to be able to keep up with how quickly this is making no, new data? The 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 challenge with a supercomputer is you're either backing up the data that you're putting into it or backing up the data that's coming out of it. The data that's all like in motion that's actually being used in the supercomputer itself, you don't back that up. You know, that's not really relevant. Uh, and that's what's su- really super proprietary. So the data going into it is typically like massive amounts of CSVs or, mm-hmm. or just raw data being fed into it. The data coming out might be databases, tables, things of that nature. I- easy to back up. You just write quantum on the backup <laughs> disk yeah. and you're set. It's quantum backup. Yeah. Perfect. I like it. Just All tell right. people their their technology isn't advanced enough to recover it. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's there. Oh, you're still using this? Oh, I don't think yeah, that's going to work. Wrong. Yeah. Incompatible. All right. Uh, our next article, it looks like somebody got pwned. So let's find out who. Looks like you're about to get pwned. Fatality. Yeah. All right. So based on the headline here from VPNOverview.com, which is Sega Europe thoroughly scrutinizes its cloud security. Sounds like either Sega got pwned or all of Europe. <laughs> so I'm assuming Both. it is Sega. <laughs> this time it is Sega. And and just to clarify, like they didn't get pwned by a, a a, a black hat hacker or something like that. This is a case of they brought in pen testers or you know researchers to go and look at their environment, and the researchers not only were able to find a way in, but like basically just pop the lid off of everything. It, it's really shocking what they were able to get access to, and it all started with an exposed Amazon S3 bucket. It seems to do that a lot. We had a couple last year. I thought it would be great to start off 2022 with another one right here. This is a big one. In that bucket, they were able to find credentials and other information to internal systems, which allowed them to make that leap into the internal systems. And from there, I mean... It, this is a textbook pwnage right here. Oh, yeah. They got their Steam developer key to be able to, to change what's published onto Steam. Uh, RSA keys for a number of systems. They got hash passwords. Yeah, their MailChimp like, <laughs> login. Yeah, this, the MailChimp API key, which means the, the, the researchers could have sent bulk Massive email emails. out as Sega, or Sega Europe at least, uh, they got the full AWS credentials mm-hmm. to be able to get in and, and mess with instances and storage there. Like they got you, access to everything. You know what's fun is if they were to use those credentials to like basically take over the account, there's no way to get that back. Yeah. Like, or at least it's not really easily. Yeah. <laughs> could, have they, could they have made better Sonic movies? 
<laughs> you know, it, it's funny you mentioned Sonic because they have like the list of domains that were compromised, and, and one of them is SonicTheHedgehog.com, <laughs> which I thought would have top-notch security. But uh... My kids <laughs> love that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. With the freaky was... CGI? Yeah. There's, a, there's a new one So he was out. like super freaky, and then they were like, he looks like an acid trip that's ready to kill us. Let's tone him down. Let's slightly. like make this a little nicer, and then it, it was a little bit better. So uh... hmm. I have not seen it. But I will say, though, if you're going to get pwned, I would want to get pwned by my pen testers. That's yeah. their whole point of right. the pen tester, yep. to yes. pwn you. And, and how cool is it that they're even telling us about right. this? Because uh, most they companies would just sweep this under the rug. Because this isn't a breach. Like uh, I mean, it, right. it's Europe, so you have to report GDPR things, but this is not a GDPR issue. Yeah, they, they right. would not have to report this. Yeah. So, uh, but, but they did. They, they allowed the, the pen testing company, uh, the you know, VPN overview and their people, yeah. to be able to go and, and release this information, which is a great learning opportunity for people. Uh, the number one lesson that they kind of stress in here is that it's so important to separate your production and staging systems that what's external and what's internal should be sandboxed and isolated. And in this case, they weren't, and they were able to jump from one to the other. So definitely a risk. Since then, Sega has, has corrected a you lot know, of you this. You'd think that they'd come up with something like, I don't know, training or certificates <laughs> that would address these issues to help people understand that we'll that's get, how We'll get to that shortly. Yeah. But oh, these are okay. these are cutting edge new you're ideas. Right, right. Nobody's done this in the past. You, yes, absolutely. Well, true. I would say based on this then, who got pwned in this case were the hackers because there was an open S3 bucket there <laughs> and you didn't even look for uh, it. Yes, it yeah. Staring shame, you right in the face. Shame on you. Make it would have bit you. Shame on you, hackers. <laughs> Uh, all right, our next. Oh man, this one's fun. Um, <laughs> and I and I haven't yet made a new WTF uh, intro because I figured I'd have at least a week. I before. thought this was going to go into the tinfoil hat segment, but I, I would have too. But but Don Don said it's WTF. No, it's a definite WTF. Oh no, I, yeah. I, I probably would have gone tinfoil hat now that you mention it. Yeah. Oh, do, you okay. me, do you want me to change it? I can change it. Yeah, sure. It's a better intro. It's a tinfoil hat. Uh, yeah, give it to see, us. But now I got to find. That. Oh, there it is. All right. The moon landing was fake. Yes, it was. Do you understand that? Oh. All right. The, this the one intro comes actually to us. helps us. It doesn't. It, it talks about five. It does. Yeah. yeah. And for for those that think that intro is fact, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the perfect article for you from theguardian.com. Anti five G necklaces, and that, that's in quotes because there's no such thing as an actual anti five G necklace, are radioactive and dangerous. Dutch nuclear experts say mm. officials issue a product alert and say, "quote quantum pendants could, <laughs> sorry, could damage DNA with prolonged <laughs> use." I just love that you're like, well, it says quantum, so yeah, it's got to do go. something Slap really that good. On the side. Uh, so, so in a nutshell, people are going out and buying things to protect themselves from five G and EMF, and those very things were actually harming them. Yeah, you know, uh, so th this was interesting because I learned a few things. Technically, everything is radioactive to some degree, right? But it's in such low amounts that it's not something that bothers us. We're not yeah. really affected by it. Uh, but what they found was that some of the materials used in these anti-5G necklaces were were a, a very, very low grade of radioactive, uh, but that if you wore them 24 hours a day, all year long, that it would push your exposure up. And because you wear it, as like a necklace, it's at the same place right above your chest that the odds yeah, of it causing... Right by the heart there. Yeah. yeah. Nothing important. So that, that's, that's pretty bad news. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've we covered before how ridiculous this anti-5G stuff is. The the, the last one... The I USB the, stick. The yeah. USB yeah. sticks, which do you remember how expensive those were? Yeah. They were uh, like it was in the hundreds of dollars. They were but hundreds of dollars. My favorite part is it worked even when it wasn't plugged in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it worked. Quotes. Air so quotes. Air quotes. These necklaces or pendants or whatever they are, I, I thought it would be funny... To buy some for you guys, and so <laughs> I, so I have to bury it in my backyard. I yeah. went online to buy some, and I was again surprised how expensive these were. The cheapest one I could find was fifty bucks, which is too much for a joke. Uh, too much for a joke. There was a uh, they, they interviewed a uh, it was like a professor or scientist on this who said, uh, you know, actually the, the pendant will block things like five G if it's in between you and the five G. But just what actually hits the pendant, it, it, like mm, right. everything just goes around it. So they, they absolutely, it's not an absolutely do pendant. nothing. Uh, so it's a, just another ridiculous thing in the Full 5G crap, conspiracy. Don and I yeah. love too that they, they had um, sleep masks as well because I, I, I ended up looking at some other products here. And I'm like, yeah, so let's put it right at the brain, the, yeah. this radioactive yeah. stuff. and. Oh. Oh keep goodness. it from getting in the eyes. But uh, I went down a rabbit hole then of like these pendants um, and things and, and reading the reviews on Amazon. They were like, I put it by the router and I can't even get a signal now. It's like, 
unplug the router. What? <laughs> what? Is, why? Oh, God. You can't have the yeah. internet to put this review on. Well, one one thing they mentioned is that like it's it's literally impossible to change the trajectory of the five G waves. Like it's not like this pendant is going to suck them in and yeah. reroute them. So unless it's in between you and the destination. Doesn't do any good. Uh, one of them, I think, it was a different article, was saying how like a frying pan would work better. Just hold the frying right, pan up because it's bigger. <laughs> yeah, a big sheet of metal and less then. less radioactive. Yeah. More than I'm, a, I'm assuming. And, I like and, to douse myself in tritium. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you mention that because yeah. like there are some radioactive substances that we use. Yeah, like and, tritium. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I said like the pe- the things people were trying to avoid were uh, negative ions. I believe is what they were saying. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants that negativity. Yeah. Hey, awesome. your smoke detector's got uh, americium in it. You could use that. You know, uh, and it's like twenty five dollars at Lowe's. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that what that Boy Scout was doing? He was like trying to make something. No, that dude straight up made like he actually contacted like Eastern European. Uh, nuclear facilities so that that said cake. he was a researcher and they just shipped it to him oh he was like, like uranium, uranium? And platonium. yeah mm. like yeah like real uranium all right and yes he did build a nuclear thing in his like barn shockingly died of cancer oh that high no. school student from yeah. california yeah. yeah he was like a like an eagle scout it was his eagle scout project where he hit the the doc was he said he was going to make a a a bomb out of out of the plutonium they sent him and then oh jeez Back to the future. Back to the future. <laughs> That's all you got to do is just tell them you're making a bomb. <laughs> you made a time machine? Yeah. I don't know. DeLorean. Doc. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just still disappointed that Don didn't think 50 bucks uh, was worth it. Yeah. I have a price scale. You like, could have killed us both for 100 bucks. <laughs> if, if I could have got it for 20 bucks, you guys, uh, it, they'd be ordered. But yeah. For something I'd have to bury in concrete in my backyard. <laughs> hey, if any of our listeners out there sell illegal 5G <laughs> anti-wave blockers, please contact me. I did notice that uh, specific one that was mentioned in the article is not on Amazon anymore. It leads uh, to... You know, uh, a 404 page. We gotta have so. a promo code anti 5G. Well, yeah. I, I did a search. There's still tons of products on Amazon. Yeah. I, I don't know if they're the radioactive Amazon, ones or not. Like, I'd be well, fine straight with, up Amazon. Yeah, I'd be fine with some crystals. Get some crystals. You channel your aura. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we want to let you know about some upcoming webinars here from IT Pro TV. First of all, we have Cloud Computing Confidential: Secrets to Leveraging the Cloud in Your Organization coming up Thursday, January thirteenth, uh, with David Lynchcomb and Mike Roderick. Uh, it's going to be a good one, so you can head over to itpro.tv/webinars to sign up for that. Uh, we also have Resolutions for Your IT Career in 2022: Expanding Your IT Experience and Learning New Skills. That is Thursday, January twenty seventh, with Adam Gordon and Chris Ward. We're kind of pushing the the boundaries of resolution time um, by January 27th, but you know that's fine. Uh, we can do like second quarter resolutions. Or that's right. Yeah, you can work on it's those. It's December so. 31st, 2022. Yeah. time for those. Resolutions. There's still time. There's still time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. get it done. You can slide it in. Yeah, my, my resolution is to finish this before the end of the year, yeah. at any time. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> ITPro TV, uh, ITPro TV slash webinars is where you're gonna uh, want to go to check those out as well as all the past webinars, and then head over to technado.com and you can see all the latest episodes. You can get some swag, you can subscribe, and you can click that big orange button in the corner that says Sponsored by IT Pro TV. You can get 30% off for the lifetime of your IT Pro TV personal membership. You can also request a team trial to see all the great features available to teams uh, from IT Pro TV. So, yeah, technator.com is the place to check that out. Woo-hoo. All right, guys. Uh, good good start to the year here. 2022 underway. Already had, uh, had some tinfoil hat stuff, so... Uh, that that's a win to me. I've already got an article <laughs> that I want to select at the end of the year for yeah. my favorite article of the year so far. Yeah. Put that in the bank. So let's see if we can top that next week. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you next week right here on Technado with Don Pizzette.